Спасибо большое за приглашение. Я очень рад, что я могу здесь докладывать по-английски. Как Андрей сказал, и тоже я очень рад, что я работал по этим вопросам сотрудником, вместе с сотрудником этого института Андрея Купавского. Наверное, вы знаете, не сколько из вас знаете его. Да. Но он сейчас довольно долго уже находится в Стэнфорде, да. в Швейцарии, но вот у нас... Вы, например, знаете, я знаю. Это ваш студент, да. Окей. So this is, uh, I'd like to talk about a uh, beautiful open problem. Uh, если вы что-то не понимаете, тогда скажите, пожалуйста, и тогда я попробую... Медленнее, я, конечно, я тоже на английском языке, я, я из Венгрии, я по-английски не... Very good. Okay, so whatever, whatever, whatever you don't understand, please shout at me, uh, you don't have to raise your hand or whatever. Uh, because uh, uh, if you don't understand something, then, then the rest, uh, it will be <coughs> difficult to understand the rest. Okay, so uh, there's a funny uh, long title. There, there are all kinds of things in the title, starting with uh, Tarski's Planck problem and controlling function classes, of course. You don't have to know any of these things because I will introduce the definitions. I'd like to show this picture uh, at the beginning. Uh, this shows uh, two people who actually uh, play the role in this problem. Can you see the picture? You see? Uh, so on the uh, right hand side you see Paul Erdős. Uh, both of these people are Hungarian mathematicians. Paul Erdős on the right hand side and on the left hand side Laszlo Fejestot, uh, you will see his name. He was a, a person in packing and who worked all his life in packing and covering, and uh, his books actually appeared in, uh, uh, in Russian, in German, in English, uh, and um, a fairly well known person. Um, and, and Another reason why I showed this picture, because this picture was taken in the, uh, at the Rainy Institute, which is uh, my institute in Budapest, uh, where in spite of the fact that I lived uh, most of my professional life uh, uh, abroad, I was always uh, affiliated with Rainy Institute, and I, uh, I am very proud of that affiliation. Okay, so let's start with this Tarski's Planck problem. Uh, which is uh, a problem, the, the, the first problem, actually one of the first problems that, that I heard when I uh, joined Rainy Institute uh, uh, fresh out of the university. I heard it from Laszlo Fejestot. Uh, very interesting problem. And that time I was very much upset because I couldn't solve the problem and I thought that if you go to work at an institute, then the way how it works is that you have a boss and your boss will give you some problem and if you don't solve that problem, then next year you will be fired. Now, this problem unfortunately is still unsolved <laughs> to a large extent. It was asked like uh, uh, more than 80 years ago and I don't think that they fired anyone for not solving it. So, so what is the question? The question is a very simple question. Uh, so if you have in any space uh, you have, can you see that? Uh, can, uh, you have a body, a convex body, uh, for instance in three space, but it, it can always also be in the plane. Then you can define the width of this set. And the width of it is just, you take uh, uh, two 
hyperplanes, in the case of the plane, two parallel lines, and the smallest distance between two parallel lines so that the, the, the uh, body is between them. In three-dimensional space, you take two parallel planes, and you position those two parallel planes so that uh, the distance would be the minimum distance and uh, the body is between them. So this is the width, width of this, uh, uh, this convex body. So if I denote uh, this body by I don't know, C, then this number is W of C. I, I will use this, uh, uh, this notation. So what Tarski originally asked was the following, that uh, imagine that you have a number of strips. Now, I will use these words, actually, the strip. I don't know if you, it's uh, sufficiently, can you read this? OK, so, so strip and slab, uh, I use it in the same sense. Uh, I guess that if you are in the plane, then perhaps it is better to uh, say a strip uh, in, in higher dimensions. It's better to say, uh, use the word slab. Uh, but what Tarski used for the same thing, it was the word plank. And for some reason, uh, this is what uh, uh, is used in the literature as Tarski's plan problem. So, so in the plane, what, it, what, it, what the problem is that, so you assume that you cover this uh, uh, convex, uh, your convex body with some uh, strips, parallel strips, two lines and what is between those lines. Of course, uh, those uh, parallel, those strips, they also have a width, right? So, so the width of this is w1, the width of this is w2, just the distance between the, between the lines. Uh, and uh, it's a very simple question uh, that uh, uh, what, what uh, Tarski actually conjectured, that if you take, uh, if, if you cover a convex uh, set by, by uh, uh, strips or planks, uh, then the total width of uh, those slabs, W1 plus W2 plus and so on, should be at least, what is this noise? So it is at least uh, the width of the convex set. Of course, I mean, you can cover uh, your convex set with, with one strip uh, of this WC, and then it will be tight. But maybe if you can use different, uh, a lot of different kind of strips, then, uh, then maybe th there is a better, better way of covering it. Uh, and what Watarski conjectured that this is not the case. It's not entirely trivial. I mean, if you never, never uh, uh, saw that, you play around with it, then, uh, then uh, you have to check yourself that, for instance, if you take a, a unit disk and you uh, cover it in a, I don't know, a non-trivial way uh, with three slabs, three strips, this one and this one, what? No, the other one, this one, and the third one, then the total width of them is really bigger than the diameter of them. But this is the case. Now, uh, this problem, if you are talking about this particular example, when we have a disk, a circular disk, uh, then this problem has a beautiful solution uh, which uh, Tarski immediately noticed. Uh, in fact, he wasn't the one who first found the solution because the solution was, in some sense, goes back to Archimedes, to Archimedes. So this is the, the uh, solution. So let me just draw a picture now. 
uh, I, this is the disk, except that now I am trying to draw a three-dimensional picture. So this is in a plane. And uh, put a hemisphere uh, on this, on this uh, disk. Hemisphere, so that this, this is the great circle on that. And now, uh, take any, uh, any strip in the plane, like this strip here. Of course, this will cover a uh, part of the disk, right? Now take that part of the disk and project it vertically up to the hemisphere. When you do that, then uh, you will get uh, on the hemisphere something like, you know, I don't know how to call this. Uh, <coughs> It's, it's, it's a little uh, sort of spherical strip which goes around the hemisphere. And uh, there is a remarkable thing that, again, if you uh, learned your geometry in high school well, then you may have seen, but otherwise you have to prove it. It's, 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 it's really almost trivial to prove, uh, but rather surprising that now if you take this strip and you move it around, uh, then of course if you move it around, then the area of the part of the, uh, part of the disk that it covers will change. Because if you move it all the way to the side, then it will cover only a very small area. If you move it to the middle, uh, the strip, you translate it to the middle, uh, then, of course, uh, uh, it will uh, uh, cut out of the disk a rather large chunk. chunk. But no matter where you move it, uh, the area of the projection of this piece onto the hemisphere, it won't change. In fact, uh, if you, if you uh, want to prove it, then it will boil down to the fact that the uh, derivative of uh, the cosine of alpha is uh, what minus sine alpha. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just uh, so. This means that that I mean, once I tell you this, then it is uh, kind of intuitively clear that because if you push it to the boundary, then of course this this will be a small area. But when you project it up, it will increase because here the sphere is kind of steep, right? Do you understand what I'm saying? And if you, if you push it to the middle, then in the middle, uh, this area here is bigger. But once you project it up, uh, it, it won't, increase, uh, won't increase that much because, because here the the, uh, in the, towards the middle, the, the sphere is quite, quite, quite flat. And in fact, the uh, sort of proportion by which uh, it changes is, is, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, can be expressed as, as a, by multiplication of a factor of uh, cosine. OK, so this is, this is, uh, this is what Archimedes uh, uh, discovered, and uh, what uh, Tarski knew, and then of course uh, the uh, proof of this fact for the disk is, is completely trivial, because uh, because what happens, oops, sorry, uh, uh, what happens is that. Um, uh, then you can express that the uh, area of the, uh, so if you have a strip here, and you intersect the disk with a strip of, uh, of uh, width w1, then the area of this uh, 
sort of uh, curly strip around the hemisphere will be exactly 2 pi times the distance between these two lines. So if uh, you have a bunch of uh, strips that cover the disk, then after projecting them up uh, to the hemisphere, they will cover the whole hemisphere, right? Uh, so this means that after projecting them up, the sum of their areas will be just the sum of uh, 2 pi wi. And uh, since they cover the whole hemisphere, it should be as large as the, the uh, area of, of half of the hemisphere, which is, uh, which is uh, 2 pi. And then you get that uh, W1 plus W2 plus so on should be at least one. So there is, uh, there is a kind of uh, bad news concerning this. First of all, this proof, unfortunately, uh, very much uses the fact that you started out with a disk and not with any other uh, uh, convex body. And uh, uh, Gardner actually uh, uh, proved that this is, a, uh, this is a serious problem. And in some sense, I don't want to formulate it exactly, what he proved was that this proof, the, 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 uh, the conjecture of Tarski may be true, but this proof definitely doesn't generalize. Uh, there is no measure that you can uh, give on, on uh, this, the intersections of the strips uh, on the, with, with the disk. Uh, so, so here I gave a particular measure to, to each uh, 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 intersection. Uh, I actually assigned the area of the projection. But you could give any other kind of measure, and there is no good measure. So it was a negative result. However, there was a positive result in 1950, uh, 1951. Bang uh, managed to prove uh, Tarski's conjecture uh, in general by using completely different methods. Uh, but the bad news is that uh, uh, somehow the conjecture has a stronger form and that stronger form uh, is not even known in the plane today. And you look at the, you, you look at the problem, and uh, well, I can tell you what the, the stronger form is, and you just don't understand that, that if you know how to prove it, uh, so why a slight modification of the problem kills the proof? Well, unfortunately, it does kill the proof. So the uh, one specialty of the disk is that the disk looks exactly the same in every direction. But here, for instance, in this picture, uh, the, uh, uh, this is like an oval, and the width of it is in this direction. And if you take two parallel lines uh, in this direction, then the distance between them is much larger. You can uh, introduce the notion of uh, uh, what is usually called relative width. So what is the relative width? So uh, the relative width is the following. I take a strip, like this strip, and I don't measure the width of this strip as the distance between these two lines, but the distance between the, these two lines uh, divided by the distance of the, by, by the width of this body in this direction, right? So in every direction, it has a width. So if, if I fix this, uh, this direction, then in this direction, I take two parallel lines so that the body is in between them. I, I calculate the distance between these two things. And, and uh, I take the uh, width of this slab, and I divide it by that number. So the relative width uh, of, of, of this strip in, every, in, in, in a given direction is always a number which is between 0 and 1, right? 
So uh, now the conjecture is that assume in the plane, I formulated in the plane, assume that uh, you cover a convex body by a bunch of strips, take the relative widths of those strips, they must add up to at least one. We don't know. We don't know this. Uh, of course, uh, if, if you cover the, again, if you cover with, uh, your convex body with one strip in any direction, then the relative width of that strip will be one. So, but, but uh, it's not clear why you cannot do better. I think it is, a, it, is, it is a beautiful problem. And here I mentioned that the last serious result in this direction was achieved by Keith Ball. Uh, who managed to prove this uh, stronger conjecture in the case when uh, the body is centrally symmetric. Uh, yes? Uh, what is the division uh, for example, w, uh, w of this one? It's a ratio between the distance between the, those two parallel lines and uh, perpendicular and uh, similar width. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, 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 so if, if, if this is your body, then if you have a strip, this strip, uh, in this direction, the relative width of it will be very small because compared to the distance between the two parallels in this direction, this is nothing. But if you sort of allow, if you turn this around, then uh, the same, stri same strip, the rotation of this strip in this direction is actually not that bad because in this direction it is like almost one half of the, uh, yeah, it's uh, curious, yeah, it's, it's, it's a beautiful question. I, at least I find it very beautiful. Okay, now <clears throat> let's go a little bit further. Uh, the uh, Feierstott, as I said, uh, worked on, on uh, packing and covering problems and uh, questions that are uh, uh, kind of related to Kepler's conjecture. So Kepler's conjecture is that, that, that uh, what is the most efficient way of packing unit balls, right? You take a huge container and you want to put in your huge container as many unit balls as possible. How many can you put in? And, and it's a, uh, it was an old conjecture that the, essentially, at least asymptotically, the best way of doing it is that, that uh, you make kind of a, uh, uh, what is called a hexagonal layer of uh, balls so this will be like the first layer, and then you put in the holes uh, a second layer of balls. It's, it's like, uh, uh, you know, oranges are packed on the market if they are nicely packed. This is, this is the most efficient way. Uh, many people believe that now this conjecture is proved because uh, about 15 years ago, uh, Thomas Hales uh, gave a computer-assisted proof for that, uh, but the in fact, to check that proof, you also need computers. Uh, so there are quite a few researchers who are, who are skeptical about, uh, uh, about this result. Anyway, uh, these packing and covering questions, in some way, they are dual to each other. Uh, so covering question, it could be the same question, but except uh, uh, for, for packing balls in a large container, uh, you want to cover every point of, the, uh, every point of a large container uh, with unit balls, so that each ball uh, belongs to at least one of them. Uh, that question, no one even claimed that is solved in three directions. At any way, because of this duality, Feierstott immediately thought that, that uh, we can think about uh, uh, we can think about uh, Tarski's Planck problem uh, as a covering problem. In fact, if you take it into the extreme, 
uh, this question. And in the ex extreme, you can say that, OK, instead of, instead of a disk, I consider the whole plane. Right? And as a consequence of, of the uh, Tarski's uh, Planck theorem or, or, or whatever it is, that if you cover the whole plane by strips, then the sum of the widths of those strips must be divergent. So if these strips, you have a bunch of strips, S1, S2, infinitely many. And if their union covers the whole plane, then this is a corollary. Then, then uh, uh, of course, in particular, they cover an arbitrarily large disk. So the total width should be infinite. So you can think about it. OK, let's assume for simplicity that all of these strips have uh, unit widths. All of them are equal to 1. The fact that uh, they cover the whole plane, uh, you can formulate in the uh, following way, that uh, uh, no matter what point of the plane so, so first of all, you can think of these uh, strips so that uh, each of these strips has a midline, right? OK, let it be not a unit strip, but let, let's assume that the width of each strip is equal to 2. And you can say that, that the fact that I covered the, the plane by uh, strips of width 2 is equivalent to saying that I manage to find lines so that every, for every point of the plane, at least one of the lines is closer than one. Right? The same thing. And then I'd like to do it efficiently. I'd like to uh, find kind of a sparse system of lines. OK, he turned the question around. So what happens if we want to solve the other problem? Assume that we want to place points in the plane so that they have the property, infinitely many points, so that no matter which line I take, uh, I will find a point which is closer than one to it. What is the sparsest arrangement of, of uh, points? Well, of course, uh, uh, he immediately noticed that there is a rather sparse uh, arrangement of, uh, of uh, points, because you can do the following thing, that uh, you take the plane, and uh, uh, this is the x and y coordinates in the plane, and uh, uh, you take uh, every other integer point, 0, 2, 4, 6, so on, negative, negative 2, negative 4, and so on. Of course, now, if you take any line, then any line will pass through between two such points. So if you took these points, then these points are almost good because uh, to this point, either this point is closer than to one or that point is closer than to one. But almost all points, almost all lines are fine because, because those lines that are parallel uh, to the x-axis are still not covered. Therefore, uh, you should also take every other integer point uh, on the y-axis. Now, now, absolutely every line will be covered, right? So here, if you think about it, then uh, if you look at, uh, so th this is a good system of points. So in this system of points, if you take a uh, sort of circle of radius r around the origin, then the number of points you picked is linear, grows linearly with, with r, right? So, and, and uh, he actually thought that let's, let's measure the density of this point system. 
uh, as the number of points uh, in, uh, in the uh, circle of radius r around the origin. And this, this we denote as, uh, as uh, uh, how, how do we denote it? NPR, P is the point set. So the number of points of P in a circle of radius R. Of course, it depends on where you fix the origin. But the order of magnitude doesn't depend. So for this particular point system, uh, the order of magnitude is, is linear. It's big O of R. So the first question that he asked was that, uh, is it possible to choose little o of r points, fewer than this many points, with the, with the property that no matter how you pick a line, you will find a point uh, close to that. So I, uh, the answer is yes, and uh, this uh, uh, was in this, uh, I like this uh, uh, question a lot because uh, uh, this resulted in my first uh, joint paper with uh, uh, Paul Erdős, which was followed by 20 others. So we, 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 said, we proved actually that, that uh, the, answer is, uh, uh, the answer is yes, uh, it is possible. Uh, and uh, our first solution to that was rather simple and natural. Uh, I just uh, uh, quickly uh, indicated what the basic idea was. The basic idea was that we take a spiral. Of course, if you take a spiral, then we don't get much. Uh, but this spiral, it's a misleading picture. Uh, it sort of goes away from the origin very, very fast. In fact, uh, the equation of it, if, if we move phi, this is the angle around uh, that how much we turn it around, then, it, then we will be at distance uh, e to the e to the phi. So uh, if, it, if it doesn't grow that fast, then, then nothing special happens, because then what happens is that you would take uh, every, points along this spiral a distance two from each other. And it would still be true that if you take a line, then this line uh, would intersect. In fact, it would intersect in infinitely many points, this spiral, right? And, and then it will be closer to one of these points than one. However, uh, the spiral moves around so fast uh, that uh, it will intersect every line very steeply. And since it is very steep, uh, therefore, we can choose points on it very far from each other, and still they will be close to that line. And, and this, is, this is what this construction knows. But this wasn't particularly, I mean, so exciting. It was uh, kind of uh, uh, interesting. But the, the more interesting part was, that actually we managed, managed to characterize uh, precisely uh, that uh, how uh, sparsely you can arrange points in the plane so that they have this property that uh, every line goes close to at least one of them. And uh, I, I don't want to I, I just want to tell you what the characterization is, but I don't want to uh, tell you the proof, although the proof is uh, completely elementary and, and uh, uh, rather simple. Uh, the characterization is the following. That, uh, so I give you a uh, sequence of numbers, x1, x2, x3. It's increasing sequence, infinitely many, uh, infinitely many numbers. And now uh, I take, uh, for every i, I take a circle around the origin so that the, the radius of this circle is x of i, right? 
So there are all these, uh, all these circles now. This is x1, the radius of it is x1, x2. And, <coughs> and now my job is that on each of these circles, on the circle of radius xy, I like to put a point. On the circle of radius x2, I uh, want to put a point somewhere. So that at the end, uh, th this infinite point system will have the property that uh, no matter how, uh, uh, how I take a line, uh, the, it will go close to one of the points. And it turns out that, so, so I can say that in the following way, I want to control or cover all of the lines. And I can do that, I can control the lines This means that I can pick good points on these circles if and only if, if and only if the sum of the reciprocals of these numbers is, com is uh, divergent. So if the sequence x1, x2, x3 grows very fast, then, of course, uh, the, the sum of the reciprocals will be convergent. And then, indeed, my job will be difficult because I have fewer possibilities to, to, to put points to control all of those lines. If it grows rather slowly, then I am in a good... Uh, 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 I am in, in uh, a good shape because uh, uh, because then, then I can put uh, points so that, uh, so that to cover. <coughs> so here there is once, once I do, I do that picture, so let me say just something about it, that, that what it, w how this, uh, the sum of the reciprocals of one, of 1 over xi comes into the, into the picture. I just want to indicate it without, uh, uh, without uh, uh, proving it. Assume that our job is simpler. I just want to control all of those lines that pass through the origin. OK? So imagine that now here is this uh, circle of radius xi. So, so, so those, I mean, uh, the total measure of those lines that pass through the origin is something like 2 pi or pi. It depends how you measure it, right? by the angle. Uh, so all of the lines that pass through the origin, uh, it is a set, set of lines around the origin. The, uh, you, you can measure it by the angle. The total measure is 2 pi. Now, take on this circle x i one point. I call this point p i, which will be the lines passing through the origin that will be controlled by this point. Well. They will be those lines that uh, pass uh, close to this point. So essentially, all of the lines uh, that are uh, in, a, in an angular region, and what will be the angle of this angular region? It will be 2 over xi, roughly, right? Because this is here 2, this is 1, this is 1. So this is roughly 2. And uh, this distance is xi. So this angle is at least in radians, or how you say that, right? Uh, roughly 2 over xi. So if the sum of these reciprocals is smaller than uh, the total angle, which is 1 or 2 pi, depending on how you measure, then you have no chance uh, to control even those lines that pass through the origin, right? But if it is infinite, then you can actually uh, uh, cover all lines. But, 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 but this is here the, the uh, kind of basic observation. OK. Now, uh, we went uh, one step uh, further, actually. I don't know how much you can read it, but I will uh, explain everything which is, uh, uh, which is written on the transparency. So I said something about controlling lines, right? 
But uh, lines, you can consider lines as linear functions or whatever. But in fact, you can think in a much more general way. You can uh, slightly modify this question and, and uh, this uh, uh, is done by this definition. It was done like uh, 30 years ago that imagine that we have a class of functions. So this I denote by f. This is just a class of functions. So you can think of that as uh, uh, maybe the class of linear functions or the class of uh, uh, polynomials of uh, uh, degree d or uh, the class of trigonometric functions like uh, a times a times I don't know uh, the square of cosine of x plus three times sine of x okay, whatever function whatever function you like and then you can say the following so these functions these functions uh, are defined on the whole real line. And now I give you, just like before, I give you some sequence of numbers. It doesn't matter. They can be, I can also assume that they are all positive. It makes no difference. An infinite sequence of numbers. And I have these infinitely many functions here. And uh, what I like to do is that uh, uh, for each of these xi's, I'd like to put a point above it. So this point will have coordinates x1, y1. This point here will have coordinates x2, y2, and so on. So that no matter which function of my function class I take, like this one, there will be a point in my point system uh, which is close to that, closer than one. So now it is more convenient to measure the distance vertically. So this is what is written there. Uh, you, you look at the fourth line there. It says that if I take any function f of x, f of x in my function class, then I can find uh, uh, an index, a point x, uh, an index i, so that if I take, at the, take uh, the value of the function at the place x i, this is this, then its difference from y i will be smaller than or equal to 1. Right? This is what it means. So I'd like to find values y1, y2, y3, heights at which I would put the points above x1, x2, x3, so that if I look at this point system, no matter which function of my function class I take, there will be one of these points so that the function passes close to that point, which means, like if it is x2, y2, it means that if I uh, look at the value of the function at x2, then it will closer, it, its distance from y2 will be at most 1. Right? Is it clear? Yeah? Okay. So, and, and then uh, the uh, question is more or less the same as before, that what is a condition uh, for these uh, uh, sequences x1, x2, x3, x4, uh, uh, so that I, I would be able to do that. So for the linear functions, I can uh, tell you uh, uh, well, very quickly what it is. So for the linear functions, uh, so what is a linear function? A linear function, a line, uh, can be written, so if, if my function class will be just the lines, straight lines, uh, linear functions, then each linear function 
can be written, L of x can be written as, a, uh, as a, by an equation ax plus b. So there are two such constants, and these two constants determine the linear function. Well, uh, OK, so here is my point xi. And above xi, I want to choose a point whose coordinates are xi, yi. This point is pi. I want to do it for every. Okay. And let me fix for a second that point. And let me see that what are those lines that uh, sort of pass by this point at a distance closer than one. But how can I look at the space of lines? Well, the space of lines, if you wish, can be characterized by these two numbers, A and B. It's just a two-dimensional thing, right? So you can think of uh, each line as a point uh, in the plane AB. So once you choose A and B, then, then this point will correspond to that line. And you write down that what will be those lines that, uh, that uh, uh, pass through close to these points in that, in that plane, in this plane uh, AB. And it will actually turn out that uh, it is a strip, exactly a strip uh, of uh, width uh, one, width two, I think. So here I have written it down. Then the set of those lines that I controlled, that are controlled by, by uh, this point, uh, they form a strip. And now it's, it's not uh, very important. I can even tell the normal vector of that strip. But the width of the strip is roughly 2 divided by xi. And uh, what does it mean? Uh, that I change the value yi because I am free to uh, free to move uh, this this point above xi as high as I wish. I'm free to choose this uh, number yi. Choosing yi will correspond to a translation of that strip. You just look at the equation. It is. It, it, it turns out that it is just a just a translation. So, so then, uh, the problem that I get is that I have a bunch of strips. Uh, the width of strip number i is 2 over xi. And you want to translate. The question is whether you are able to translate those strips so that you cover the whole plane AB. This will correspond to the fact that I am able to uh, choose values y1, y2, and so on, so that the points x, i, y, i all together will control uh, all, uh, all, uh, uh, all linear functions. And for that, well, uh, we actually managed to solve this problem because we managed to find that uh, actually uh, it is possible to find uh, uh, a translative covering. It is possible to translate these strips uh, by a proper amount uh, if and only if the sum of their widths is divergent. So we got the following thing. I hope that uh, in this transparency it is uh, printed, which is uh, first uh, somewhat surprised us, but it l looks rather natural. And it ha I, I think we have 10 more minutes. Yeah, I, will, I don't think I will use all of it. Uh, so, the, so this is the, the uh, uh, actually we managed to uh, prove that, that uh, if you have a bunch of strips uh, and uh, 
then and the widths of the strips is uh, the widths of the strips are uh, w1 w2 uh, and so on then uh, we can cover the plane by translates of these strips uh, if and only if the sum of the widths is uh, divergent so i mean this sounds very, very similar to uh, Tarski's Planck problem I started with, right? Because there I said exactly the opposite of it. What I said was that uh, assume you cover the plane by strips, then the sum of the widths of those strips should be divergent. What I said now is that take any system of strips whose uh, total width is divergent, you can translate them without rotating them. So you can translate the first strip, the second strip, the third strip, and so on, that at the end of the day, the whole plane is covered, if and only if the, 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 uh, the width is divergent. And in fact, it turns out that, that um, uh, the crux of the matter is uh, a finite, uh, a finite theorem, or finite lemma. So the, uh, uh, the assume that you have a system of strips. If the sum of the bits is bigger than, let k be like a disk, the perimeter of the di unit disk is 2 pi. So if it, the sum of the bits of these strips is bigger than 2 pi, then you can individually translate those strips so as altogether they cover the unit disk. So, so if this is true, of course, this lemma is true, then uh, it immediately follows, but what I said immediately follows. So this means that then uh, it is also true that uh, if the sum of the widths wi is divergent, then uh, one can translate the strips so as to cover the whole plane. Why? Uh, because we have seen that if the sum of the widths is bigger than 2 pi, then you can cover, you can translate the strip so that you can cover a unit disk. Right? So you have a, a sequence of numbers uh, uh, with total uh, widths infinite. Then you can cut that sequence into, uh, into little parts so that within each part, Within each part, uh, the sum of the widths will be bigger than 2 pi, right? So the, with the first strips, you translate the first strips so that you cover this disk. You translate the second strips so that uh, you cover this uh, disk. You translate the third one so that you cover this. You translate the fourth one so that you cover uh, this. So finally, uh, since you have infinitely many such uh, sections, uh, you can cover infinitely many little disks which all together cover the whole plane. So this is a, a simple consequence. I uh, invite you to prove this lemma. Uh, so the, the, in fact, uh, I can even uh, tell you the I can even tell you the solution of the proof. Four minutes, I know exactly. Uh, so I can even tell you the, the idea of the proof. Uh, but after we had the proof, it took for us uh, more than a day to convince ourselves that the proof is correct. So here are your strips. And you know that the sum of the 
uh, width of the strips is bigger than 2 pi. And now you do the following thing, that you order the strips according to their normal vectors. So you, these are the normal vectors. So here are the normal vectors. So in, there will be a first one, a second one, a third one, and so on. And then uh, you take your unit disk, and then you take your first strip, uh, which is normal vector, is the first one. And you translate it so that you uh, cover a piece of this disk, this piece of this disk. And then you are remained, you are left with a smaller piece. You take the second strip, and your second strip, you start moving it so that you cover the upper part of the remaining part. You cut it off, and so on. <coughs> so uh, this, is, this is my last slide. I just want to say that this is the case is very similar uh, to what I started with, with Starsky's plane problem, that uh, in the plane we know what the situation is. In three dimensions we have no idea. So this is the problem that I'd like to close with. Imagine that you have slabs in the three-dimensional space, parallel planes and what's between them. Uh, assume that the total width of those uh, slabs is infinite, and you are allowed to move those slips, those slabs, uh, translate them without rotating them. Is this condition that the total width is infinite enough to make sure that uh, you can translate individually these slabs so that they cover the whole three-dimensional space? This is what we conjectured uh, with, uh, uh, in, in, uh, in a weak form, we managed to prove something similar with Andrei Kupavsky, but the conjecture, as it is stated there, is still completely open and uh, you are invited to think about it because it's perfectly possible that there is a solution to this problem that uses nothing else but uh, trigonometry. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>